Hey everybody, good morning. My name is Lisa Jarrett, welcome back. Um, I'm one of the co-founders and co-directors of KS Mocha and KS Mocha is the Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. School Museum of Contemporary Art. Um, this is a project that exists inside and alongside uh, Dr. MLK Jr. School and it's a collaboration between Portland State University School of Art and Design um, and Dr. MLK Jr. School located in Northeast Portland, Oregon. Uh, my co-founder and co-director of the project, Harold Fletcher is here this morning as well, as well as one of our primary collaborators Amanda Lee Evans. Uh, this morning we're going to hear again from Ilya Yakovenko as part of our Chaos Mocha 2021 remote artist residency and lecture series. And um, I also have Mo, one of our fantastic project participants here to introduce Ilya to you. Um, but before we start with Mo, I just want to shout out and give a huge thanks to the students at Dr. MLK Junior School who are watching via our live YouTube channel and to all of the folks at Dr. MLK Junior School that make this work possible, including Principal Jill Sage, Nancy Rios, Michelle Peak, and Paige Thomas. Um, thank you all so much for your ongoing support. Uh, without them, none of this would be possible. Um, so Mo, would, would you care to tell us a little bit about Ilya before we hear from him? Hi, I'm Mo. I go to Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. School. I'm the head photographer at Chaos Mocha. I'm introducing Ilya Yakovenko today. Ilya is a cultural worker, artist, curator, poet, spectator, and cultural ad ambassador to Portland. Ilya is an MFA student in Mo, we lost your sound for just a minute. Can you hear us? Hey, Mo. Just a From around the world to Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. School. Ilya spent his childhood in Mariupol, Eastern Ukraine. This region is currently dealing with war. To heal images and building, building more, more e equitable, equitable inclusive. inclusive and safe future, Ilya is learning to explore history, memories, cultures, and idea Identity. identities with art. Ilya takes to make art projects with other people. Thank you for being here today at KS Mocha. Welcome, Ilya. Hi, y'all. Uh, thank you, more for this great introduction. Thank you, Lisa uh, and uh, Harold and KS Mocha for having me here. I'm super excited. Uh, so today I'm going to give a presentation about my work. And uh, I also try to connect it to the history of Ukraine. So give you some context uh, about my work. But also, to me, it's important because uh, I want to, like, provide an example or in a way illustrate how art and stories told by art uh, can tell us a lot about the context where this art is created and about the history of the place where this art is created and about the political and social situation uh, that is, uh, yeah, that kind of influenced the art and the artist. So I will share my screen. Um, just give me a second, share my screen, optimize, to share, and present. Um, just want to double check that people see my presentation. Could you give me a thumbs up or? Yeah, perfect. Thank you, Mo. Uh, give me a second. I need to move the, yep, perfect. So this is me giving you the presentation. Uh, I, as you already know, and as, as I mentioned from my previous presentation, and as also Mo mentioned in my introduction, I come from Ukraine. Uh, this is Ukraine, right? I come specifically from the uh, from this uh, region, and this region is commonly referred as uh, Donbas, and it known for its like industrial industrial past and present. Uh, this is my 
hometown of uh, Mariupol, where I uh, grew up. And uh, I think I left it when I was 16 years old or, or something. So quite a while ago, but my family still lived there and I kind of visit the region uh, often. And just to give like some historic background. So this region uh, was or started to be like started to become a significant region both for the Russian Empire and then later for the Soviet Union, and especially like during the Soviet Union when the uh, yeah when they start heavily industrialized the region, uh, it created like a lot of so a lot of artists in a way became inspired by the region and inspired by the you know aesthetics of the industrial revolution and stuff. And so they, uh, so there are like a lot of significant works of uh, the Russian or the, yeah, the Russian avant-garde commonly. Uh, this type of art is referred as, uh, as uh, Rus uh, to as a Russian avant-garde. So uh, many Russian avant-garde artists were kind of inspired by the region and uh, uh, like prominent uh, Ukrainian movie director, Diga Vertov with the Jewish uh, ancestry he uh, created like a number of uh, super famous avant-garde movies and he shot them in, in the region on the left. Uh, yeah, on, on, on your left, you can see this uh, stills from his movies, uh, from his movie, The Symphony of, Don of, of Donbass or en Enthusiasm. Uh, then this is a Russian artist, uh, Dainaka, and he also kind of was inspired by the region. Here we have Vasily Yermilov, who is a, uh, quite famous uh, Ukrainian graphic designer, uh, an artist. Uh, and uh, yeah, here is like some of his graphics. And it's also interesting because even this small uh, kind of graphic picture, you already see some tensions between Ukrainian and Russian kind of culture present in this region because there is this way how he uh, writes Donbass he used like, and I mean, I can't really zo 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 zoom it in right now, but in general, like generally, if you see the picture, like a close up, you would kind of, see, you will be able to see that um, first it had, it had only one letter S, which basically the way how the region is uh, spelled out in, in Ukrainian, but then later he had done like another letter S, uh, which, how it is spelled out in Russian. And so, yeah, some tension there. And this is a poster. And this poster is kind of a random poster that I just like found uh, on the internet. But it's interesting because it says that Donbass is the heart of Russia, even though, even back then, Donbass was part of the, uh, part of the, um, the um, Ukrainian Socialist Republic. But you know that for the Soviet Union, kind of in this, uh, uh, I don't know, in the vision of the Soviet Union and the vision that was created by the Soviet Union, then bus was kind of heavily considered as a very important part of the whole, you know, region, but all, not, not only of, of Ukraine, but also like of, of, of Russia. And uh, yeah, I just wanted to show you an excerpt from uh, Diga Vertov's uh, Symphony of Donbass. <laughs> And uh, so I think it's, ah, uh, yeah, it's 1930s. And I think it's one of the first Soviet uh, uh, movies with the sound. So yeah, it was quite experimental and in a way also like how the, uh, 
like how the shots are made. Uh, yeah, it's very like, in a way, visually significant. Uh, and then I wanted to draw like the influence because even like this industrial past of the past of the region, even right now, like up until now, it's very up until these days, it's very like it has a very significant cultural impact or cultural significance for people who are come who, like who live in the region and who are from this region. And there is the uh, small excerpt from a music video from 2019, I believe. Uh, and it feels like, yeah, it's interesting how uh, it uses similar visual images uh, and aesthetics that Digavert have used and was informed by similar aesthetics and probably inspired by these aesthetics. Uh, oh, why? Excuse me. I think it, yeah. Yeah, I'm really sorry because uh, it was supposed to uh, start at specific. Yeah, so similar aesthetics, similar like visuals, and also like even what he sings, he says like that the, I give my God to the, uh, I give my soul to the God and my body to the working rope or to the working suit. Uh, so yeah, quite significant and prominent part of the region is this industrial past and to some degree present. But also what's interesting, like this movie Digavert of 1930s, where they kind of he in a way tries to glorify this, uh, you know, industrialization and building of this all of these new factories and you know creating all like, almost like a new aesthetics around the uh, or inspired by this industrial uh, revolution or whatever. Uh, it's interesting because it happened 1930s and then in 1932 to 1933, the same region and the adjacent regions in Ukraine we were exposed to man-made famine that was kind of made by the, our orchestrated by the Soviet Union government from Moscow. And uh, I think like about, like there are different uh, estimates, but normally people would say like from four to six million Ukrainians have died because of this man-made famine that was basically uh, kind of orchestrated, but also like specifically uh, carried out by the government and by the soldiers because besides that the people were taking their land like pe pe people got taken like their land taken by the government and also they were like supposed to uh, provide the harvest so basically the government have taken uh, took the land from the people and then they said like told the same people that now they should work on the government and provide them the government with harvest and if they not able to fulfill the requirements that the government kind of imposes on them, then they will just, you know, take everything that the people had and because of people couldn't like really fulfill the requirements for like with, with, with the harvest and wheat and stuff and like produce. So government just took all of their like food and all of their stuff and then encircled like the villages with soldiers and didn't let people out. And as many people try to get out, they would just, you know, execute them on place uh, on the spot. So yeah, it's just, you know, they literally uh, genocide and it's considered a genocide in Ukraine and, and other places uh, as well. So so all of these kind of things were happening simultaneously, uh, you know, industrialization and then at the same time uh, genocide and killing of, uh, of people in the Soviet Union. And so eventually this is a more uh, kind of contemporary image how uh, so uh, on the right side, you can see this picture from my hometown, Mariupol, when it, had, when it was uh, uh, shelled by the uh, pro-Russian 
forces uh, like a residential neighborhood, like many people have died because of this specific shell and because of specific type of weapon that they use that kind of trans like the name is grad or hail in English and it's really impossible to control or it's possible, but you know, it's a very like, it, it launches like 20 mi miss missiles and, or missiles and uh, yeah, it just covers these huge areas. And so it fell on the residential neighborhood uh many deaths and uh, yeah and then on the left side this is the map of the of the region so this is the Donbass region and then this is the part that is controlled by the uh pro russian kind of self-proclaimed breakaway states so this is my hometown mariupol and it's like maybe three five miles from the uh which is right now a uh, kind of contact or uh, there like the line of uh, of confrontation and this is Donetsk which is now a capital of the like the capital of one of the self-proclaimed breakaway uh, republics uh, and this is the place where I lived for five to six years when I was studying uh, uh, when I was an uh, undergrad student right and uh, yeah and with this region is actually like the history is uh, super complicated again so this is the region and I mentioned the uh, element of uh, industrialization that started even before the Soviet Union, so even before like 1917 revolution. Uh, it's actually started, I think, in the, the at the end of 80th century, beginning of 90th century, uh, when when uh, Russia managed to uh, defeat the Ottoman Empire because this was like this was a Crimean Hanite, Hanite and it stayed a Crimean Hanite but the thing was that after certain wars uh, in the 18th century and toward the end of the uh, 18th century yes 18th century uh, Russia managed to secure uh, some form of agreements with Ottoman Empire so it kind of not yet annexed Crimea but it was already like under the patronage of Russia and this land, which was previously previously very sparsely inhabited because of the like many reasons, climate first and foremost, you know, it's very like rough land. It's very dry during the summer. It's like a step climate. It can get up to like 100 degrees during the summer and, you know, above 100 degrees. But then the winters are relatively cold, like maybe a low twenties. So yeah, quite cold in the winter uh hot in the summer and very dry so really hard to plant stuff uh and then because of the uh, geopolitical kind of situation political situation you had like ukraine uh so yeah you like sparsely controlled by uh, some proto-ukrainian kind of state uh autonomies and then uh partly russia partly ottoman empire so there was like always some kind of conflict going on here and yeah, so it was really sparsely populated and when when russia managed to secure this area they kind of start to uh realize that you know there are some resources that can be extorted from the land and but probably because russia didn't have enough resources itself it started to land or rent out this land to european kind of colonizers and uh, literally people like from belgium from france from the united kingdom kind of were allowed to settle in in these uh, areas and uh, build like their factories, some industries and uh, yeah, explore and uh, kind of get resources from this area. And I think that's a very interesting overlap because so my hometown was kind of um, established in uh, in the end of 80th century, I think it's 1770 something. And Donetsk was established a bit later in uh, in the middle of 19th century, I think 1850 or something. But interesting overlap, like let's say with Donetsk, it was a first established by like a, as a working kind of uh, village uh, by John Hughes, who was uh, an a, whatever like an industrialist from the uh, from uh, from um, from the United Kingdom. And at the same time, like similar developments happen in the United States. You have like Carnegie in Pittsburgh, uh, who is also like like coming from the United Kingdom, from Scotland, and you know like all of this kind of industrialization happening all over the world. And then it also led 
by same people or people coming from similar regions like United Kingdom, France, Belgium. Um, yeah, um, so it just felt like it's an interesting thing to mention. And also, uh, moving to my work, this is a project that uh, Mazepa Kino of post colonial studies that me, together with my uh, colleagues from the Cooperative for Creative Research, Krasnash Pana, uh, made in 2014. Uh, I think, and the cooperative of Creative Church Krasnash Mana consists of uh, three people uh, who founded the cooperative and kind of worked in the cooperative. Uh, it's me, Ilya Kovenko, then Olga Shurkastup from who currently resides in Moscow, and Alexey Markin, who currently lives in uh, Hamburg in Germany. And so together we kind of decided that we are interested in kind of reflecting on the relations like imperial colonial kind of dynamics between like power relations between Russia and Ukraine. And so we wanted to explore this and uh, specifically, uh, you know, we kind of started working together when the war happened between Ukraine and Russia in 2014 or started in 2014. And uh, one of our themes were to explore uh, certain significant historical uh, elements or characters or stories that that are interpreted differently in Ukraine and in Russia and still play a role in Ukrainian and Russian politics uh, up you know up to this day um, and this is one of such stories so uh, basically Mazepa was a Ukrainian hetman which is like a Ukrainian statesman, basically, during the uh, 70th, 70th uh, and the beginning of 18th century. And he was, uh, you know, this permanent state figure who was kind of fighting for the autonomy of Ukraine. And back then, even though like parts of Ukraine were kind of controlled formally by the Russian empire, but Ukraine had an autonomy. And, you know, Mazepa was a kind of an autonomous leader of this kind of proto-Ukrainian state. And uh, so, yeah, they were like already in, uh, always in this negotiation and, you know, never considering themselves as being like completely, uh, you know, following the rule of the Russian emperor, uh, Peter the Great back then, back in those days. And so, and at a certain point in the beginning of 18th century, Mazepa actually decided that they want to go, uh, that, he, you know, they want to go against Russia and they tried to fight Russians, but then Russians won and so Mazepa had to flee. And after that point, Ukraine was completely uh, kind of stripped uh, away, like stripped of its uh, autonomy. So it became like in a way annexed by, 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 by the Russian empire and uh, uh, became like administratively and in many different ways, kind of directly controlled by the Russian empire, you know, people by, you know, sending governors and stuff. Because before that there was an autonomy and then after Mazepa uh, kind of, Unfortunately, last uh, uh, Russia kind of get a tighter grasp on the uh, on Ukraine, and uh, so in one like in one hand, on the one hand, on in Ukrainian historiography right now, Mazepa considered to be like a hero, right, like a very significant permanent uh, figure who was kind of who stood against the uh, you know Russian imperial ambitions and tried to get independence for Ukraine. On the other hand, in Russia, he's considered to be a very uh, bad person. So like almost like a villain, right? And even church, like the Russian Orthodox Church kind of despise him. And there is an you know, anathema, uh, anathema, or I don't know how to pronounce this, right? But yeah, basically he was uh, uh, kicked out of the church and every year up until these days, uh, they like uh, remind that Mazepa uh, so they have a special service where, where they remind that Mazepa is not a member of the church anymore and that Mazepa is kind of cursed for the rest of the whatever life and uh, or even after death and his uh, soul burns in hell or something like that, uh, which is like hilarious. But yeah. And uh, uh, yeah. And so this is one part of the story. Another part of the story that Mazepa became a very significant hero, like a romantic hero or romanticism hero in, uh, in, uh, in, 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 in Europe as well, 
which is weird, but yeah, it happened because uh, Voltaire, one of the historians, like European historians, French historians, he kind of mentioned him in one of his whatever historiography is, uh, like his history, history books, and then in a way, people like Byron, like an uh, English poet, and uh, uh, you know, got, got inspired by this story or whatever, and so he wrote a poem about Mazepa, a Ukrainian hero who was like, boy, yeah, it's a, it's a long story, but one of the major images that he produced is that Mazepa was uh, tied naked to a horse and then sent to Ukraine uh, by a Polish king whose wife, I don't know, Mazepa tried to uh, seduce or something, so Polish king became mad, and so he sent this Mazepa to, uh, he tied the Mazepa, like naked Mazepa, to the horse and sent the horse, whatever, uh, somewhere, and then Mazepa was like, like, yeah, so it went for days, and then the horse kind of fell dead you know, on Ukrainian soil, and then Mazepa was discovered by some Ukrainian woman, and later on he became Ukrainian, uh, yeah, king or whatever. So there is the story, and it inspired a lot of uh, different uh, histories uh, in, in in Europe, and it became part of the uh, European painting tradition. So, like this is Theodore Jericho, French uh, painter, who uh, you know painted Mazeppa on horse. But later on, it also like traveled to the United States, and probably people know about Mazeppa from this. Uh, whatever, like uh, burlesque uh, uh, Broadway show. Uh, I don't remember, I think the name is Gypsy or something, but yeah, so there, it, it has a character, uh, Mazeppa, who is a, a woman, uh, uh, Adam Enken, who played Mazeppa. Uh, so yeah, so we have Mazeppa as this character and with my, so together with the people from uh, the Cooperative for Creative Research Press and Spana, we decided to, you know, research this, topic and uh, you know different histories around Mazepa and the symbolic meaning symbolic value significance that it has both for Ukraine Russia even Europe and how this myth kind of uh, was created and together we then performed like made a public performance uh, in Moscow in the old Russian uh, exhibition center formerly old Soviet exhibition center and to give you some context it's like a huge park that was built during the Stalin period and uh, it's a very like it has all of this neoclassic kind of Stalinist architecture and you know there are like pavilions for each of the Soviet Republic or yeah former Soviet Republic and all of like they're huge they're like super uh, yeah in a way just it was built to promote this image of you know wealthy Soviet Union and represent every republic in this Moscow park so um, there is a Ukrainian pavilion down there. And after the war started, in 2014, Ukrainian kind of decided to stop uh, renting this pavilion. So they kind of, uh, I know, rejected the pavilion. And uh, at the point when we did the performance, we did it like at this, um, uh, all Russian exhibition center next to Ukrainian pavilion. And at the time when we were doing this exhibition, I believe there was this um, uh, this performance. I believe uh, in the pavilion was an exhibition about the war in Don in, Don in Donbas region, but also like from the perspective of you know Russian kind of uh, propaganda. You know that the war that's going on there is uh, I don't know that Russia supports that states whatever to break away, and that in Ukraine the revolution is a was a bad thing or that happened in 2014. So yeah, so basically. We have this pavilion and we perform performance about Mazepa uh, without any authorization, public space. But, you know, in Russia, public space is super heavily controlled and you can get in, you know, in troubles if you make public political actions in public without, you know, any previous permission from the state. So, yeah, people get arrested for that. And we were trying to kind of think about like, oh, how we can make a political statement, but also be in like and make it as an art, as, as an art, as art. So in a way it can protect us to some degree because you know if we say like this is art we're just you know like rehearsing or doing a play or performing you know maybe it can be uh, maybe we can get away with this and so yeah so we settled uh so 
we, we create this performance super political about Mazepa, about war in Ukraine, both like I was reading it in Ukrainian at certain moments, so you know, Ukrainian language in Russia, in the space, it, it's already like a statement, right? Uh, and I can show you a brief uh, excerpt from this. Uh... So this is this horse. Moment. So the horse dies and Mazepa is lying uh, on the horse back. <laughs> uh, yeah, and uh, so yeah, like all of like uh, the story, it was like, I think 15 minute performance uh, in this public space. And it involved all of this, you know, conversations about uh, about the colonial, like about the Russian imperial pa uh, past, about the war with Mazepa and uh, Ukraine and colonialism and current war. So yeah, let's bring all of these topics. Uh, yeah, and then it it brings us to a next uh, work again created by the cooperative uh, for creative research Krasnaya Shpana. Uh, again, the map. So here we're gonna talk about Kiev, which is right now the capital of Ukraine, uh, currently the capital of Ukraine, and a little bit about this region, which is not specifically Donbas region, but it's kind of adjacent region, and. Uh, yeah, so, and this involves the uh, the name of the project, who does the avant-garde belong uh, to Malevich project. And this involves this person, uh, uh, Kazimir Malevich, who is kind of quite prominent figure in Western art historiography and for Western art, whatever, like canon. Uh, so uh, he painted this quite famous picture or painting black square uh i think in 1914 or something uh and it again influenced a lot european uh you know bauhaus and other kind of avant-garde art art uh and at the same time probably later it's also i mean we can kind of speculate a little bit but that it's also influenced american uh, abstract expression uh, expressionism later after the Second World War. Um, so yeah, so this person was born in the uh, in, 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 in Ukraine, in uh, Kiev, which back then was uh, part of the Russian Empire in the end of the 19th century. Or no, 20th century. No, 19th century, right? So in the end of 19th century. And uh, uh, he, he was born in Kiev in this building, which is now doesn't exist uh, anymore. It has been demolished, uh, I think, during the Soviet times, so not in the 60s or something, like 50 years ago. Uh, yeah, and uh, I also showed this other part of Kharkiv, uh, uh, of, of, of region of uh, in eastern Ukraine, the, that adjacent region to Donbas. And uh, again, it's very interesting how he kind of grew up in this region when he was uh, small, smaller, like uh, when he was a kid. and 
it was because his father was uh, a manager kind of in the uh, sugar business and again like this is a whole another story how ukraine got in the way or how first ukrainian uh rich people became rich because of the sugar industry and specifically beets sugar industry because like i think at that point like again probably 18th century beginning of 19th century some i think german or polish person figured out how to get beets how to get sugar from beets and that eventually influenced a lot the market of sugar in europe and uh, in that, that consequently also influenced the whole situation in the Caribbean and in other European colonies because it became just cheaper to grow beets in Ukraine or in southern part of Russia and then get the sugar to Europe. Uh, yeah, then get it from uh, Caribbean, even though, uh, uh, yeah, that's another topic like slave labor and stuff, which is awful. But uh, the idea is that uh, we have Malevich his father working in this beats industry uh, as an uh, not, like not 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 as an owner but as in some kind of an administrative uh, managerial job, and the Male Malevich grows up in these parts of Ukraine, being inspired by both like some form of industrialization, but still you know it's kind of more like a plantation type of in industrialization. So it's still like had this village vibes and most of the workers who were working on this kind of plantations were villagers. And so, you know, there were like set settlements all around the place and Malevich kind of got inspired by the villagers, by the Ukrainian village and by Ukrainian uh, art in this village, like, because, you know, art is also like a big part of Ukrainian kind of peasant and uh, folk culture. And so people, you know, paint their houses and stuff. And this specific thing, like Lunyev Art Museum in Pahomivka, so Pachomivka was one of the places where Malevich uh, father worked or, and uh, Malevich lived. And um, um, the thing about it that uh, later on uh, in 1955 or something, a teacher in this town, a school teacher in this town uh, organized a museum with his students and they Kind of the idea was that they will reach out together to significant artists, both in in Russia or in the Soviet Union, all around the Soviet Union, but also also international artists, and try to you know convince them to donate works to this museum, to the student museum, and eventually this museum grew in this like you know now it has a separate building, and uh, yeah, so this endeavor was successful and in a way. It also inspired the Kesmoka uh, or my like the, the idea for an um, international acquisitions committee uh, at Kiasmoka. Uh, again, it's more like a side note reference, but also heavily connected to the all of this history of Ukrainian art and art in Ukraine and geopolitical kind of and sociopolitical situation in Ukraine. And then we have, uh, uh, yeah, and so Malevich was born in Ukraine, right, in Kiev, but then he moved to Russia and uh, he is now considered a prominent figure for the Russian avant-garde movement. But what's happening right now, especially after the 2014 war, uh, or what started to happen in, uh, after 2014, that Ukraine became very interested in trying to reclaim Malevich as Ukrainian artist, and in general, in generally try to you know subvert and destabilize this notion of the Russian avant-garde. And in the beginning of this, at the beginning of this presentation, I referred to Digavertov and some of the people as part of Russian avant-garde, which is kind of problematic in a way that on the one hand, it's mostly known internationally under this name, but it's also like quite problematic because right now, you know, many of those artists were not actually Russian and we're not even working in Russia. And so, yeah, it's kind of complicated. So how you can kind of reclaim or decolonize or like art history and reclaim certain artists as being part of, you know, Ukraine or other nations, because it happens all over the Soviet Union, how, you know, prominent artists are appropriated by, by, by Russia. And this idea was to try to kind of, uh, again, research the situation and figure out like how art becomes instrumentalized by the state and how specifically the story of Malevich, how Malevich is getting uh, instrumentalized by Russia, but then 
how can can the Ukraine tries to reclaim him and like what's are, is the reasoning behind it like why do we need to reclaim an artist why does it have like such a significant I don't know uh, uh, importance to Ukraine to reclaim certain artists uh, artists and we start you know do this research and realize that right in Russia uh, yeah so you have like in subway some of the trains are kind of can be uh, um, 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 decorated in Malevich's uh, uh, paintings and in Malevich's uh, kind of work uh, to promote him as Russian artist and you know reinst like re re reinstate or just to you know state or indicate that he's like a Russian artist and it's also like uh, in a way like a domestic way of you know promoting that Malevich is Russian artist to the Russian population especially specifically to population in Moscow who uses public transit and then recently there was a competition for a tourist brand for Russia and the this is the one that won the competition and basically this one suggests that they were inspired by Malevich specifically and Russian avant-garde and now you know if you go to the Russian whatever official tourist website uh, you know they promote Russia like through this avant-garde kind of whatever uh, images so it became like a brand of uh, in a way Russia how they brand their like tourist uh, uh, I know image for the international uh, uh, audience potential tourists uh, but then at the same time in Ukraine certain attempts were made to reclaim Malevich and there was a book that was published I think in 2015 or 16 uh, Malevich Kiev uh, aspect and this book also like in, in inspired all of these activities around uh, around uh, trying to reclaim Malevich. So uh, an, an annual event was created, Malevich Days in Kiev, which incorporates plenty of other different events all over Kiev. Uh, you know, like an, an, uh, a, 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 an, a, an academic conference, let's say, you know, where like people from all over the world come, like science, science like art historians and then discuss Malevich's uh, history and in, like in Ukraine and how Ukraine influenced his art or uh, I know some events where like exhibitions uh, that exhibit Malevich not really work because there is no work or there are like few paintings of Malevich that are in Ukraine because the rest of them are either in Russia or in Europe or in the United States which is again uh, another super interesting story how eventually most of his works ended up you know in in Europe and in the United States but not in Ukraine so yeah so but there are still attempts you know to create some events that um, that promote Malevich as Ukrainian artist uh, so yeah here is the National Academy of Fine Arts and Architecture in Ukraine and there was like because he um, Malevich also uh, taught in this academy I think it was end of 20s like 28 maybe 30 uh, uh, 1928 1930 or something uh, don't remember the exact days but he was uh, he taught uh, in uh, in the art academy of ukraine uh for a while and uh, so yeah now there is a monument in the art academy uh it's this one to malevich then you have the, his portrait uh i don't know if they removed it already or not but it was there for a while uh this is the main entrance and then there were like some performances inside the academy where they were like putting his portrait among other uh, artists on the whatever the wall of uh, some significant artists that that are in the academy also because during the Soviet Union during the uh, whatever 40s 50s uh, 60s 70s definitely this kind of experimental artists avant-garde artists were kind of forbidden in Ukraine and so he was kind of erased from the academy walls uh, and wasn't present until up until recently and then another part is that uh, 1970 uh, in 2017 because of the 100 years of the uh, Russian revolution of the October revolution or yeah the communist revolution in Russia uh, Russia financed plenty of exhibitions all around the world so it was like four years ago right and uh, uh, this I think took place in New York uh, yes right uh, the Russian avant-garde exhibition mom in New York and it was it's interesting because some of the artists were attributed as uh, as Russian artist right even though I think uh, specifically uh, Vasily Emilov who I think never worked in Russia he was mostly like 
working and living in, in, in Kharkiv in Ukraine. And back then it was Ukrainian Socialist Republic, but he was still referred as uh, Russian artist because of whatever reason then uh, uh, movie director, like filmmaker, uh, Alexander Dovzhenko was also referred as Russian and Malevich was referred as Russian. So some Ukrainian activists who are living in New York tried to, you know, make this action where they claim that, you know, Russian avant-garde by Ukrainian artists. And I think even some people tried to send official uh, letters to the um, uh, Museum of Modern Art in New York to uh, reattribute the artist as Ukrainian artists, but the museum rejected th their, you know, requests, except of one to reattribute Davjanka as a Ukrainian director because it was sent by uh, the center, the Davjanka Center from from Kiev, the request itself. And I think I'm running uh, out of time, so I'll just briefly tell what uh, activities we made besides the research we did, right? And so, uh, so basically for us, it was interesting to explore all this situation around Malevich uh, and uh, how his figure is being like both on the one hand instrumentalized and uh, used by, you know, Russia to promote its own international, not only international interests all over the world. And this specific exhibition uh, in MoMA, but then there was also exhibition in Royal uh, Academy in London and in like many places, European places all around the world. And they were mostly financed by Russian money. Uh, so yeah, how it in a way works on the Russian international image. Uh, and yeah, and then the way how Ukraine kind of tries to reclaim this um, Malevich as Ukrainian artist and also, you know, use it to promote its own international image as being like this interesting and advanced country with a very interesting history that also influenced European art to a certain degree. Uh, yeah, and so to us, it was kind of interesting to explore this history, but also to use this as a uh, I know how to try to use it as a conduit, maybe in a way, like in a way again to 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 discuss and or explore the colonial imperial history or a relationship between Ukraine and Russia, and also like to discuss the current like war that is happening, both you know physical like real like military confrontation that's happening between Ukraine and Russia, but also uh, the uh, the war in symbolic space, right? How certain things are being claimed or reclaimed, like who or what belongs to whom, right? And uh, yeah, and just in general, like try to have this conversation like about war and about culture with people, but not directly addressing maybe the war because sometimes it's, you know, hard to talk directly about war, specifically in a conversation that involves both people from Russia and Ukraine. Uh, yeah, but rather like try to talk about this more like through, through the lens of uh, art and, uh, you know, talk about Malevich in this context. And so we did it in Hamburg, in Germany. Uh, we went, yeah, I'm sorry, I, I'm, I need to talk about this slide. So we went to uh, Hamburg and uh, down there we found people from the, uh, for, like from, from the community, from, from the, like people who emigrated to the, uh, to Germany from former uh, Soviet republics, both from Russia and Ukraine. And down there, we kind of tried to reach out to them and kind of gather a group of um, some individuals uh, in order to make a collective performance together about Malevich and about our experience of, in a way, thinking about like how it influenced our identity or our personal lives. And so we went to, you know, Russian grocery stores and places where we placed the announcements that we are looking for people. Uh, then we also organized a, a dinner where we invited folks. And, you know, so eventually we ended up, we wound up having like about 10 people in the group, uh, both from Ukraine and Russia, who agreed, you know, to collaborate with us on this performance. And we kind of, uh, for two weeks, we met every day and we had a whole program. We designed a program where we like discussed the the whole history or the history behind Malevich and explored the history behind Malevich, but also 
we kind of had activities like physical activities some of the events were designed some of the activities or exercises were designed by us some of the activities or exercises were designed by the participants itself we had like conversations uh yeah we invited guests and then we i have seven minutes left uh, and then we created this performance together and uh, performed it in um, Kampnagel in Hamburg. Uh, yeah, and so in this performance, it was kind of interesting. I definitely don't have time to explain uh, all of the like nature or all of the elements of the performance, but it was interesting how different people reflected on the history in different ways. And there was a person from, let's say, who lived in Hamburg, who was born, I think, even in Germany, but his family is from, uh, his mother is from Ukraine, from Kharkiv, so basically from the region where like Malevich is from. His father is from Afghanistan and he's like, so he's like mixed race Afghani Ukrainian who is German at the same time and been in Ukraine a few, like several times to be the, the relatives, but you know, in a way kind of also like tries to approach his identity as Ukrainian and yeah, it's, it was really interesting the way how, let's say, he interpreted like the whole history behind Malevich and uh, and uh, the tensions between Russia and Ukraine. And yeah, so different people explored it in different ways, but it was very nice and interesting to see how every one of us, in a way, all our sub like subjectivities were kind of individual or yeah, how we individually were affected by this processes and stories even though maybe we were not really thinking about that directly and it feels like oh what relationship Malevich has to my personal life but then when you kind of start digging deeper into this you kind of understand that many of the narratives that are created or constructed around culture and art and specifically about Malevich even they kind of yeah very relatable and in a way People can, you know, explore them from their own perspective by, you know, some who were born in Ukraine, let's say, and also like experience similar duality between, you know, being Ukrainian, but also like speaking Russian, even though you're Ukrainian. And yeah, it was very interesting exploration. Uh, this is second performance that we organized. Uh, these are some excerpts from first performance, but apparently we don't have time. There is only five minutes left. I wanted to talk about more works, but yeah, no time for that. Uh, maybe next time. <laughs> uh, so yeah, I'll stop here. Uh, uh, yeah, I'll stop. Thank you, Ilya. Uh, that was really wonderful. I have so many questions, um, but we only have a few minutes left. So I want to get some of the questions that came in to you from YouTube and um, questions, uh, maybe a question or two from our PSU students who are also here on the video today. Um, Michael Stevenson wants to know, how does work, labor, compensation, and precariousness show up in your personal practice? Uh, is it in chat? Yeah, I see YouTube. How does work, labor, compensation, and precariousness show up in your personal practice? I mean, that's very... Uh, uh, yeah, I mean, definitely it's super precarious. I don't know how it really shows up in or how I formalize it. I don't think that it's always formalized. It's definitely formalized through description to my like introduction, right? Like precarious culture work and stuff. And definitely when we work and when we worked on this project with the, like, let's say, Krasnash Panamale, or whom does the avant-garde belong to, right? We were definitely uh, discussing these questions a lot. And we, yeah, that's part of the work like or underline you know he, story that is always present in my life and through my work but maybe not really formalized in a way that it's accessible to the uh to the uh, audience to the wider audience to the tertiary audience um uh or not yeah not not, not immediately accessible but definitely we consider that and in a way we always try like or i always try to you know, like let's say if we invite people to participate uh, to uh, remunerate or to you know pay them money uh, for the work or the involvement, uh, yeah, uh, I think that's my answer. Thank you so much. Um, we have maybe one more question that we have time for. 
Uh, this is from Maya, who is also a student at PSU. And she's curious, as someone who has little experience with social practice, um, I'm interested to know how you got into it and how your understanding of it has changed throughout your practice, if it has changed. Yeah, sure. So uh, I got into it by realizing that I'm interested in working with people. And because like the first performance, um, like Mazepa performance, right? It was less social practice performance. It was definitely like, you know, like we performed in public space. So it was kind of a uh, certain degree. So yeah, it was in a public space. We performed in public space, but it's still like we worked on this performance alone kind of. But then with like Malevich and there some other art projects or some other of my projects that I didn't have time to talk about. Uh, yeah, they involve people in a way. And I realized that, especially after doing this Malevich performance, that it's actually much more interesting to explore certain things together, like or collectively with other folks, even not necessarily these folks should be artists. And maybe it's even better if the people are not it's just like people from the community and not really artists because you can learn so much from them and their perspective is super valuable. It might be like different from your perspective, but it feels like it creates a better picture, a better understanding of the socio-political reality and different kind of symbolic and uh, I don't know, contextual, conceptual things that are happening in, in our reality, in our world. And so, yeah, it felt like I definitely want to access and cooperate and collaborate with people because it makes the work so much richer but also like while i was working on these projects on the malevich project and other projects uh, i realized that it also needs or it necessitates um, a certain skills in order to be able to actually build something together with people and not simply you know use people or exploit people or uh yeah be more sensitive and also like figure out some form of uh middle ground where you can both like your work can benefit from the work like from the contribution of the uh, the community but also the community can also benefit from the uh, you know being part of the work and maybe getting something out of the work and how your work yeah can become sort of like uh i don't know useful to the community so i think my yeah my stance definitely has changed and in a way that i really like this is the reason why I'm in the program right now in the United States in art and social practice program because I want to learn how to uh, how to work uh, with people and how to co-create with people and how to maybe even to some degree co live co live or coexist with people <laughs> uh, and be creative together. Uh, that's the answer. Thank you so much, Ilya. That was really wonderful. Uh, you actually taught me something completely new about art history and it's made me rethink everything else that I've learned in those ways. And I think that's one of the other really wonderful things about your practice. So thank you for that. Um, next week, everybody, uh, we will look forward to hearing from Sohila Azadi again. This will be her second lecture in a three series lecture um, for, for that artist. And we'll see Ilya again in spring term in a few months uh, to catch up on what he's been working on and how his project alongside uh, Dr. Amoki Jr.'s students has progressed. Uh, we appreciate everybody's time today. We hope you have uh, really nice weeks and weekends. Um, next week's lecture begins at 10 a.m. Pacific Standard Time, and you can catch it here on our YouTube channel. Um, and it's also archived there. So if you missed one and you want to go back and watch it, um, they are all there for you to um, enjoy. So thanks again to our Dr. MLK Junior School students. Um, thank you to Mo for the wonderful introduction, and uh, we'll see everybody next week.